I'm going back to some of the questions from last week, among other things. But let me return us back to some more scientific areas to consider My former term of a paratopical universe would be to locate a place where the micro and the macro would meet. And the times I have been going into the realm of particle physics and quantum theorem, to remind you again, is not that the world of physics is any more involved with this than religion is. But what is taking place is the approaching the completion of a certain loop of articulation. And it will not come about with a bang, as the fundamentalist preachers would like to believe, that someday there'll be a clap of thunder, and that all of humanity will go, you know, my God, I've reached a new level of consciousness mechanically. But there is going on right now activity, particularly in the world of physics, wherein, if you remember the drawing I did of the Isles of Articulation, and I came back around to the left-hand side of the one loop that I was drawing, and I was giving you very direct hints, or I even stated that in a certain sense, physicists believed that they were involved was getting very close to narrowing down the reductionism or quantum reductionism, if there would be such a thing, to the area that they would find the beginning of everything. They could explain away not only God, but all questions as to where did this come from. But remember, I made it a dotted line, and I point out that seemingly this is what is going on. It will not happen with an immediate bang, but it is taking place while you're alive that what they are doing in physics is about to complete a certain loop of articulation. And it coincides with my threat to you that there amounts to the beginning of a new circuitry in humanity. Because once this loop would apparently be completed, it would be, I remind you to change pictures in midstream, my old merry-go-round. It is like the merry-go-round taking one turn and the center worm screw is about to go up. And if you had the distance from it, physically or otherwise, <coughs> that you could see that this has made a loop since 18 so-and-so or 19 so-and-so up until whatever date you were sitting there observing. Until this day, July the 17th, 1990, whatever then you could see, if you had that kind of distance, that it has made a complete loop, but everyone on the merry-go-round would not feel that it had suddenly reached a point and this worm screw had an obvious jump in it to where everyone on the merry-go-round felt like it is not that. It just gradually becomes the way in which human consciousness at that time is dealing with the questions of who I am or what's going on. The full OAI perception. Now, I was going to pull this into some general areas having to do with what seems to be specific maps or specific ideas and how they gradually change and how they are changing in you and what the limitations of the purpose was. Let me start off and try and give you three or four in a quantum sense confusing examples that should clear the matter up <laughs> or vice versa. <laughs> How about back to one of the first ones I ever pulled on you, the so-called uncertainty principle. Wherein, at the subatomic level, you have that
principle wherein a particle cannot be identified as to its position while simultaneously being able to identify its momentum or its velocity. And the way in which I pointed out to you, or attempted to get you to pursue it, that there was a quite strange parallel between that and one attempting to find out what I is. Someone recently, or several of you over the last few months, have pointed out to me or asked me if I was ever going to get into one of Heisenberg's corollaries of not only not being able to precisely measure or to pinpoint a particle's position and simultaneously its motion. Those of you who read up on such things, of course, I changed it for a while from velocity or momentum to simply motion. And that the basis of that would seem to be, again referring in general to ordinary physics, that when you reach this level that is about to tie up one loop of articulation, that is about to be a paradigm of the ending of a certain epoch in the development of human consciousness, that when you have these two positions, in this case, or these two questions, where is its position and what is its motion, that the more you can apparently pinpoint and determine one, then the less you can determine the other. And hence those throughout history that have been attempting to pursue this idea of no life self into what appears to be even specific hoodoo physics of attempting to be a continual observer of oneself or attempting to remember that I am here regardless of what's taking place, that there is a substantial, a stable me in the midst of this and that no one can do it. And they've been pursuing this idea, give or take a while, five or six thousand years. And most of you had heard and had your own apparent thoughts about the matter and I asked you the great musical question before, what had you or anyone else ever come up with other than the fact, well, I can't do it, with perhaps a parallel feeling that therefore it is of great importance, that you can get an immediate sensation that there is an eye here, no matter what you say, there's an eye here right now. Okay, what's this motion? What's it doing? All right, just a second, I'll tell you. And you can't do both. You can't hold the feeling that there is a me in here and then to simultaneously, let's say we call that the position, that there is an I in me. It's here and now I can feel it. All right, what's this momentum? In other words, what's it doing? Okay, I'll tell you that. And you can't. The corollary, I wasn't really going into it, but since several of you have brought it up, it's a variation of that of it being a matter that you can determine the kind of energy involved with an event at that level. And likewise, you can attempt to measure the time involved for the event to occur. But you can't do both. Which somebody recently, I guess I'll eventually have to go into it, since several of you have been close to it, a finding a curious parallel in their suspicions about some of the things I've talked about and what it would be to apparently be able to transfer energy into time, which according to this, I'm still, I'm just referring it right now as a map in the horizontal world, this Heisenberg corollary of un uncertainty. That apparently, the impossible can be done if you're dealing with very short periods of time. Beyond that, that ordinary consciousness would even conceive of as time, or beyond that, that they would have readily means to measure time in a laboratory. That apparently you can steal from time and give it to energy and vice versa, which goes against all laws of the conservation of energy. And yet it seems to happen. And several of you have already begun to put forth rhetorical questions to me. Did that have any possible relationship to attempting to neuralize? Did it have any possible connection with me giving the continual battle cry of don't tell yourself what you're doing?
none of this can be true. This may be true in theory somewhere. It may be true in some obscure mathematical way in the wild and woolly world of non-observable subatomic physics, right? Let's assume it does. But that could have absolutely no validity in the real world. That they will admit, they state outright, that what seems to be true in the world of quantum physics is not necessarily true. That is, from the macro world into the visible world. That none of this can be true. It is like two different worlds. And yet, without even going into the corollary, there is an absolute, once you see it, obvious relationship between the fact that this thing that everyone ordinarily conceives of as being themselves cannot be both pinpointed as to, yes, it's here, and I'll tell you what it's doing. And if we decide to get any better, that yes, there's a certain kind of energy involved with this, and yeah, I can tell you how long it took to happen. And you can't do both. <laughs> Before I make it a little clearer, let me give two or three more confusing possible examples. How about, let's jump up into the macro world. that it's absolutely undeniable that the better educated are those who are most open to change. And the less educated amongst humanity are those who cling most dearly, at times even ferociously, to the status quo. That is simply irrefutable. But if you get into a paratopical universe, if you get into a location wherein the impossible, that which is operating at such a high frequency in the light spectrum is operating so quickly in what would seem to be the time frame as far as ordinary consciousness is concerned, If you get into that world, then you are in a closed system wherein it is not true to say more education makes one more liberal. It's simply not true. It's not untrue, but it's not true because then you're left with, but the ultimate potential of being more open to change would likewise lead one to be inclined to pursue additional education. That's just as true. But if you can see it in a certain way, it is going from one point that I make the statement that I stand by verbally that is irrefutable, that the better educated throughout the world are those who are most open or more open to change. And from there it can go in two opposite directions. More education makes one more liberal and more agreeable to change, experimentation. Let's call that one direction. But it's likewise just as true that that is not correct, that it is already the biochemical genetic makeup of that individual to be that way, which makes them pursue education. And if you look back down to the older parts of the nervous system, you find those people who are being driven as opposed to more yellow circuit people who would be those that I was first describing, of course, the more, the better educated. If you go back down the nervous system into the older areas of the circuitry, then you find the bricklayers. And bricklayers, people from Alabama and New Jersey, and people from Tarzana, are notoriously not open to change. You don't really have to look to New Jersey or to Alabama because if you belong here, you can find it in you that the voices are still stir, the energy still runs, that you may think to yourself, my, how opened up I am compared to two years ago. And suddenly, I don't know what's the brand new latest thing to hit 
Manhattan today. But let's, how about let's move back a few months to where maybe the first time some of you in the last year or so, first time you saw kids on the street in Manhattan, they show on the news, and girls with their hair shaved down one side and it's purple, and apparently they're looking as ugly, let's say you're 30 or 40 years old, they're apparently they're looking as ugly as they can. And your circuitry just recalls at it. And there you are, the most liberal, a man who is much more perceptive than the ordinary person. And the first time you're struck with something that is brand new to some degree, and you can feel right down here, down in Alabama and everybody, in those circuits, he goes, hey, there. Yeah, come on. It is the nature of the growth of humanity. It is part of the stability. It is part of the balance that into the older circuits to pinpoint it as though it existed or could exist in isolation, the red circuit. It is not open readily to change. But then you can take from my position I start out to say in one direction to say education the more the better educated are more open to change then you're left with what's been going on for thousands of years is to say all right you're correct about certain groups of less urbane people even in this country being opposed in some unprofitable unanalyzed manner to being opposed to change. What we should do, instead of sitting around, is we should get down into the areas wherein we have those that are dropping out of school, the bricklayers, whether they be out in rural areas or in downtown Fort Dix. And what we should do is educate these people. The proof being just what you said, that is referring to me, that the better educated are those who are more open to change. Therefore, if we took bricklayers, and we could get those bastards to get at least through and get an undergraduate degree, we would not have these prejudicial, racial, religious groups. We just wouldn't. You don't go out to a Klan rally and find PhDs. You don't find neo-Nazi parties being led by a man who's even articulate. I mean, you just talk to him, you find out that the head man of that group is the guy with the best education, maybe the ninth grade, proof positive. They're the ones who are always dragging their heels, not only in this country, but throughout the world and throughout history. But I have to tear apart the fabric of justice again, but I assume all of you understand that if you could grab bricklayers and force them to go back to school, which you couldn't do, but if you could, you do understand that that is not going in the direction that the words would initially indicate if you were talking about a literal justice, that all we'd have to do is educate people who are inclined not to pursue education, and they would be more liberal. They would be more open to change. To put perhaps more succinctly, one more time, there is no such thing once you reach a paratopical universe as a literal chain of cause and effect. How about another confusing example? Uh, let me couch it in terms that may sound of the body politic. And of course, you know I'm not talking about that. It's just an example. But apparently distance between groups of diverse people causes suspicion. Thousands of years, as far as history goes, there's always been life speaking through someone here and there saying, all right, if we could get the Goths and the Romans, if we could get them to sit down somewhere, maybe have a good banquet, a two or three day orgy and banquet, if they would learn each other's language a little bit, if they'd come there and see each other's customs, if they would not operate on the basis of suspicion being caused by the distance between us, then we would certainly cut down on the hostility. Perhaps we would stop wars. 
today, of course, is Russia and the United States. We should have more people-to-people -people programs. We should not be treating the USSR as though they're on another planet, although they're practically on the other side of the world. They're still humans, et cetera, et cetera. The suspicion surely is increased, if not caused by, this great distance, semicolon. But then I would have to give you a corollary to that to wrap up the example. Then close proximity produces its own kind of stress. Manhattan, Mexico City. So wait a minute, if distance is going to, if not create, support this kind of irrational, unprofitable suspicion between us peoples, say the United States and Russia, then why don't we find this big field somewhere or take over another country and we'll move everybody door to door. You know, pretty soon we'll know each other's language, our cultural habits. We'll be eating each other's food. But if you do that, then you're going to have the kind of stress that they find and that all of you should be able to feel, most of you, except those of you who were born in apartments, and I don't go into that. <laughs> and I don't trust that, and I don't even want to think about it. But on a large scale, if you moved all these people together, you would have a new kind. I was going to call it stress, but you would have a new kind of hostility. So what are you going to do? How about one more? Can anybody even follow it all that I'm still talking about the same thing? If not, I'll try and make it a bit more clearer when I get through with the examples. How about this one? I assume that all of you have some knowledge, as much as I do. It's been reported ever since World War II about the absolute controlled press in Russia, specifically that they are hardly want at all, by all reports, to report the least bit of bad news in their newspapers, on their lengthy television news programs at night. <laughs> this is an accepted fact, and I accept it. Let's go ahead and use it. That all they do, news programs go on, I think the last time I heard was like three hours a night on one of the channels in Moscow and beamed all throughout the USSR. And it's supposedly, by those who keep track of such things, it is a glaring exception if any sort of negative report ever makes the news. I mean, a plane can crash in downtown Moscow, they say. You know, several million people see the son of a bitch crash in downtown, and it's never mentioned. There are people out shopping day after day, and they're having to stand in line for five hours to get a used corn cob. <laughs> but on the news, on the news what they report is, is they continue to report the great success the last five-year farm plan had. When the people are faced with walking outside and stand in line all day, you know, to get a little piece of used cheese or something. But they never report that. All right. This is not just a joke, uh, there is validity to this. I haven't seen it all in person, but let's take it as a fact. Now you recall the numerous times I have pointed out to you, really as a question most of the time, of have you noticed that all news seems to be bad news? And yet here would be, on a large scale on this planet, contemporary times, what would almost appear to be an exception to that. Now forget what's going on in their life with the news. They sit down and watch the news and it's three hours of good news compared to what's going on here, right? But they are systematically a stagnant system. Whereas we are living at the most active, expanding, growth-based system of any people on this planet, and you turn on the news, 
And forget three hours, they can give you enough bad news in you know, 30 minutes. And so the one exception that would seem to be going on is a large group of people in excess of our numbers that compared to what seems to be going on here that I have pointed out to you, and you can see for yourself, that all news seems to be bad news. That there seems to be right now one exception. There's one group of people that apparently is getting nothing but good news. And it is systematically stagnant. How can such things be correct? Am I ever going to find out that I need to cut out even the aspects of apparent humor at times? Because the thing about good news as opposed to what seems to be bad news, is not just some passing joke. I pointed that out long enough. It has nothing to do with the networks. It has nothing to do with our newspapers here or anywhere else in the world. It has to do with the way in which life moves. But everything from the public media to the verbal intercourse between individual peoples, you're surrounded by it constantly. I pointed it out. I made it a question. And so by now, all of you, it should no longer be any sort of frivolous idea that it is simply a matter that all news seems to be bad news. That's all that seems to be reported. And it's not the fault of the media. It's not a plot. People listen to it. It seems to be the proper currency of news exchange, that it's all bad news. It's just a fact. And I point out to you, whether any of you had thought about it or not, if you were ordinary and you thought about it, of course you almost had to file it away unless you came up with a, your own small atomic blast, that there is a large segment of the population on this planet that is apparently being confronted with nothing but good news. And it's almost the last place in the world that any of us would have any business being born into. This certainly wouldn't be going on. None of us would be who we are. That is almost the antithesis of the United States using us, using this area as being the cutting edge of growth. It could not be worse and still be civilized, and yet they're getting good news. How can this be? When a certain loop is closed, anything can be. But not verbally, not logically, and not in any way that can be explained. But for instance, look at all the time I've used. We now have it in print. And all the many names, and all the numerous ways I came up with trying to point out these three forces, these three proclivities, these in inclinations, I mean naming them. You know, one, two, and three, and then C, D, and E, and then giving out list of possible names that could fit under each of the three. And the truth is, when it leaves what I've been calling a primal flow, whatever the hell I may mean by that, into this tripartite division, and these things I've been calling forces, none of them have any individual characteristics until they're named by human consciousness. And to get past the point of maps, to get to the point already before the merry-go-round does it for everyone, to be able to complete a certain loop of articulation is you get past the point of all of these maps. You get past the point of any notion 
of there being three forces. It is a point of nonverbal understanding. And some of you may find this funny. I've done it before, but you may find it funny for the first time right now. In a way, I can describe this a bit further, and it will sound like the very thing that all mystics are after and the very thing that many mystics, would-be mystics, people involved in all sorts of little activities, would say that happened to them almost instantaneously by meeting Guru X. I was filled with questions. I was filled with doubt. And I just came into the man's presence. I went to where he was in this large following. All of his people were there. And I walked in. And we sang. We danced. We prayed. We hugged each other. Then I got in line and came by. And he patted my hand. They're out on the streets. They're everywhere. I don't mean just now. It's not just a new age phenomenon. Monasteries are full of people like that. But the streets and parks all over the world are filled with people. Say, so once I found the gods, once I found my true religion, once I found a certain idea, once I found a certain book, once I met the person and he touched me, I don't have any questions. I feel happy for the first time in my life. Come join us. Well, exactly what's going on? What's the teaching? Never mind that. Uh, some of you who have read enough, uh, we can go back as far as the offshoots of so-called Buddha. And one of the ways in which it has been translated was that the whole object of being enlightened was in a direct seeing, a direct perception of reality. And let's just assume that that translation does have some validity from one language and one time to another. How could I improve on that? But yes, you may go and sit. You may just be in the presence of a great Zen master. You may chop wood for him for 20 years, 30 years, who knows how long, there's no guarantee. And suddenly one day, you just pick the ax up and it struck you. What? Never mind what, it was just, I can see now. I no longer have any questions. That is not an unfair description of being past the point of maps, but there is all of the difference in life's little universe of having gotten there, of being able to chew up every extraordinary map that you could find. The way that somebody could ask you, haven't you been hanging around that guy that talks about uh, C and D and E forces? Tell me something about it. Now I'm playing the part of someone here extraordinary enough that is getting past the world of maps. And that person says, well, tell me, what did all that mean? Or I read a little bit about what I think he said, and it sounds very intriguing. It sounds like it may be on the right track to something I'd been thinking about myself. Can you give me the details? What's it enabled you to do? Let's assume then that you broke down and tried to say something. And you were past the point of mouth. You were past the point that I no longer had to talk about C, D, and E. And this is, let me point out, not an attack on any of you that anybody's getting behind. All of you are getting behind. <laughs> not somebody, not anybody. But past the point that you no longer we're involved with, well, wait a minute, this is, how about this is C, kind of getting into a possible D mode. But this is obviously C at work here, and yet simultaneously look what's going on over here from another viewpoint, it's D. You know, I'm getting close. I'm getting to the point that I can almost see opposites existing without getting all involved with it. That's one stage. But how about being able to see? Well, let me 
carry this one further. There was a, an old blues song that the opening line went, love ain't nothing but the first stage of the blues. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take love as being somewhere related to sea force if it existed in isolation and take the blues as opposed to that, the only thing we have left would obviously have to be in the D realm. Could any of you begin to fathom this? Let me change it from Love ain't nothing but the first stage of the blues. I just couldn't resist that. Let's change it from love and the blues into good and evil, which we're talking about the same two corporations, just two different products they put out from human perception. Could you see I'm just using the terms as they seem to manifest themselves in hum human consciousness of good and evil. That evil is good breaking down. Evil is any observable stage from any viewpoint of here was good, it is dying its inevitable death. Or back to the world of musical comedy. Evil ain't nothing but either the second or third stage of good. Could you see the song as having a chord progression? Fortuitously, it happens for those of you not well versed in music, that in the Western scale, C, D, and E happen to be notes in our scale. And that you could see a chord progression. Let's use C as being good. The old constructive energy ploy. That the chord progression can go C into E. Let us use C as like good. It's like youthful hope, energy, openness to change, desire for change. And here the song goes along in C. And it can go in several ways. It can go from C and then go into the key of E. A stage or a key that is rather indifferent. And then it can go from E into D. We can also go from, in this kind of progression, go C, D, and E. But also remember that we're isolating reality and it does not start at C, nor does it end at D or E. We'd be talking about artificially jumping in somewhere and saying, all right, here is what once seemed to be C. It was proclaimed by a large segment of humanity at some time as this was good. And you can see the progression. It went from C into D or E. Uh, one example I've pointed out to you on several occasions, a sitting duck would be Christianity. To use ordinary terminology, it is still referred to in some circles as the religion of love. In a sh short period of time, it went, let's say that we were living at that time, and we were all, we became in favor of this idea that seemed to come from this man Jesus. And they were calling it Christianity, and let's say we were hanging around Rome at that time, and we got caught up in it. We won't explain why, we just thought, hey, I'm in favor of this, it seems to be the real thing. Within a period of time, were you able to distance yourself? It went from that to what? The Inquisition. The same name, different players, but the same name, and they're now killing people. And in a sense, in a literal sense, in a verbal sense, it has become its own opposite, that it went from the key of C 
And I could even make it a certain progression in this case, but I could change it if I wanted to. It went from being the key of C from the people, from the Christian's viewpoint, those pursuing it. This is good. Now we're talking about at that time you would have to distance yourself past one lifetime. We're talking about more than several generations. It went from being C, that if you had to live long enough, if, that is if you were distant from it in time. It went from that, became the state religion of Rome, <coughs> went into a period in the key of E. It was rather indifferent. It was almost impotent. It was just a thing hanging around. And it seemed to get revived again. But it didn't get revived if we were, if still we were the same people that were there when it started. That seemed to be good. This seemed to be C-based. And you'd live long enough and you seemed to have gone into a period of almost hibernation, which is what I'm really referring to as rather indifferent. That you couldn't really identify it as being in favor or being motivated by C or D. And as elusive as E still seems to ordinary consciousness, let's just lump it there. Let's just assume that it'd be safe to say, well, that was, it was going through a transitional period of E. Still, if you were distant enough, that is, if you'd live long enough, then you would be observing them, bringing people in, torturing them, burning them, cutting them apart under the same name, and you would be faced with having to say, compared to everything else, this thing has become its own opposite. They move from the key of C to the key of D. Those of you really fleet of circuit, I might jump back right quick and point out, had we been good dyed in the wool Tory Romans, if there had been such a thing, right, good nationalistic Romans when Christianity started, our view of Christianity, need I point out, would not have been that of, listen, we're all in favor of that. It was very dangerous. They were talking about the gods, attacking the gods, they were attacking the economic basis of the Roman Empire, which already had a world of problems. They didn't need this. It was political upheaval they were teaching. That's the way the Romans interpreted it. So had we been Romans at the time, I'm just going back up here for a second. This scenario I just played out for you of one possible one from the, those involved with Christianity, of apparently going from C to E to D, the Romans could have seen it as starting out that this is nothing but absolute D. But then they may have seen it as something seemed to have happened from their viewpoint. Or let's say we were the Romans and still we could distance ourselves. We'd live long enough that suddenly something seemed to happen, that Christianity seemed to have become more accommodating. You know, these fanatics seem to have come to their senses. They're paying taxes now, and uh, some of them running for office. They're marrying into some of the senators. It's like old Roberts joining the Methodist Church. <laughs> These people are coming into the mainstream. So had we been the Romans there, we could have seen it as going from D, maybe directly into C. Like, hey, they're okay. Our religions and things were falling apart, and they're going to help stabilize our crumbling empire. That was after some number of years. That no longer they looked at as D. Hell, let's adopt them. It's good for us. Made them the state religion. The general point that I was going to try and is again that once the primal flow has been divided into the basic three areas that it must to produce the circuitry in us, to produce the minimum force to make life grow in this visible sensual spectrum in which we live, those three forces in truth have no name. And I've spent two years trying to talk one way one week or one way one minute and then five minutes later to try and jump around behind you and to point out it's a matter of whether you were the European settlers or whether you were the Indians. Oh yeah, that's obvious. It's a matter of whether you lost the money or whether you came along later and you're the guy who found it. Oh yeah, I can see that. It's a matter of whether you were a Christian at that time or whether you were a Roman. Yeah, I can see that. You can't see it because there's nothing to see. Well, I can identify, I follow what you say about C, D, and E force. Those forces have no such individual characteristics. There has to be three of them there, but there is no way in which, once you see it, that you can say, there, here's the particular characteristic of that force. It is liberal in thought, it is open to change, and it is 
in all senses of the world, it's creative. Oh, yeah? <laughs> there is some viewpoint on the grid at that point that is contemporaneous with yours. And it's just as valid and it is just as necessary in a biochemical, in a mechanical sense, that looks upon what you just described as all right, this force is very constructive. Right now, what I'm observing, what I'm describing to you, without any conditions, is creative, it's constructive, it's progressive, it's liberal, it's open to change, and there is a contemporaneous viewpoint on that grid. By viewpoint, I'm not talking about human psychology. There is another way in which life is using that thing that you're calling and observing one force. There is another place in the grid right then that coming out through another human sees it as being the opposite of what you just described. And they are not incorrect. Of course, they're not correct. But these three forces have no particular characteristic. Which I don't think I will attempt in any way to prove. <laughs> Those of you who want further encouragement until I get around to it next week or whenever, again, you can find areas in particle physics that can say almost as much as I did just then of saying, well, we can't explain this and we're not going into it. Because this ain't what we're trying to prove. They have no characteristics until they are named by consciousness. And then they serve a purpose. But the purpose is your is in part back to the necessary division, the very thing that seems to be conflict, the very thing that seems to be strife between people, the very things that seems to be strife within you, the same kinds of diverse and contradictory motivations. And I've played with it for years. Not that we won't continue to talk, but I have told everybody enough. I have given examples. I've turned them inside out. I've turned them backwards. I've fucked around with particle physics. I've misquoted Moses. I put words in Buddha's mouth. I've turned every holy book in the world inside out. I've quoted things to you that I just made up. If any of you are an expert on comparative religions, of course, you have had the decency, if that be it, not to point out that there is no such verse or line that I pulled out. Well, there should have been. <laughs> but the shift that I was telling you about is what is getting into, and that I'm going to be doing more in these public evening entertainment. That is not a continuing reductionistic, albeit extraordinary, mapping of what's going on here, because what's going on is what's going on. And what you've eventually got to do is be able to see it. And there's nothing else to talk about. Except there is something to talk about as long as you've got a question. And the only way that I could have produced enough people of the right type to be able to continue this is it had to be people who were not only filled with questions, which everybody's filled with questions, but it had an ability, once they understood, or once they began to suspect, these might be able to be answered. Not by somebody waving their hand across my forehead and saying, be not trouble my son or daughter. You know, maybe that'll work, maybe it won't, but if, if there's actually some kind of answers, I'm talking about answers that you could talk about to these, that's what I want to hear. And that's what I've told you. But I'm telling you that the answers are irrelevant. <laughs> because there's no such thing as individual forces there is no such thing as a sea force you have got to be hardwired and limited to it to see a sea force there is no D force there is the matter that love is the first stage of the blues or that evil is the second stage of love or the third stage the heartbreak disappointment is simply the second or third stage of fulfillment. But that is not the way ordinary consciousness is constructed, of course. I am now in love. I am now pleased. I'm happy with my new job, my new car, my new mate. 
Five months later, I'm no longer happy with my car. This woman is driving me nuts. I mean, the, the excitement is gone. Well, surprise, surprise. I mean, it just shows how many people did not listen to their peers when they were young when they told them there was no Santa Claus. So you've forgotten it already. Everybody forgets it. Of course, Santa Claus is synonymous with straight line theorems. That there is somebody that comes from somewhere and brings me good news and they don't bug me and it doesn't cost anything. <laughs> and, and they don't hang around. And once they bring me good news, they don't hang around the house and want to borrow money. got a small handful of questions already about or regarding my division for you and to the only possible responses that the human organism has is to act or to think about acting. So assuming I do read some of these, there's a general area that I'll run back over that some of these touched on. This should be glaringly obvious once I point it out. That the running static, what our fellow planet dwellers would ordinarily call, I guess, daydreams. But it's this running static that's going on. It is this subatomic movement. It is this continual neural activity. The static and then ordinary memory can also be seen as a substitute, as a way to substitute thinking about acting for acting. <laughs> Tell me what else the running static is serving. You already had two weeks, I pointed out that it does not think about thinking. It can't think about thinking, it thinks about acting. So it's running constantly. And it is not ever living in what seems to be the present. And so you're left with what seems to be memory. Since all of you by now have a full continuing grasp of the fact that the running static does not in truth deal with the future. It deals with the past and it reconstructs it, it attempts to rearrange it when it thinks about acting. But all that can be wrapped up into one time-honored, glorious, all-encompassing phrase. And that is the great human line of, well, what I should have done. That covers it all. That me pointing out so often that forget the past until you know any different on your own. You might as well forget the past. It doesn't exist. It's an illusion. It's the hobby of ordinary people and all my many descriptions. And of course, that's not true. The past does exist. It's going on all the time. People are thinking about it. Energy is being recycled. But now, try and picture the certain way in which I'm pointing at a small crack Memory is part of this running static that you're never thinking about right now, not under any ordinary conditions. You're not thinking about right now. You're always thinking about the past, even if you're trying to project it into the apparent future. So you're thinking about the past. And it all comes down to that one sentence. <laughs> well, what I should have done. And you can even go back and think about the acting. There is a way in which you can reconstruct the memory by thinking about acting. And when you first recall that I said so and so, and he said so and so, and I left, and it runs through a few times, a few hundred times maybe it takes, and it becomes, he said so and so. But what I should have done was say, da da da. 
a few more hundred times, a few more thousand times, it becomes, well, he said so-and-so, and that got right in his face, and I was about to hit him. A few more thousand times, I did hit him. <laughs> well, it's been so long, I'm not sure whether I hit him. I know I'm, I started to. Maybe, maybe I control myself. But my intention was to hit that son of a bitch. Is that not a nice, clean substitute for action? <laughs> and it's never too late. <laughs> We're not talking about any sort of psychoanalysis here. But with ordinary people, it's never too late. But while attempting this, and then you start being confronted, I know that many of you still see, or even suspect, a most tenuous connection between this and the two voices. But there is one of the voices that is in charge of this kind of memory reconstruction, this kind of substituting action, even after the fact, with thinking of action, that this kind of memory, which is the very thing that under ordinary conditions people think is driving them crazy. People all the way from being locked up in homes for their criminally round of mind to people just feeling as though I am individually upset and I'm tormented by my daydreams. I have certain E-Day fixies, even if I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> it should be interesting to note that they're always on the basis of thinking about action. It is always on the basis of the past. It is not on the basis that, yes, I do have very real emotional problems. That's why I had myself committed here for a while. I'll admit it. But if the person could see, you would say, all right, what is going on right now that is causing this? <coughs> well, nothing now. But my daydreams drive me crazy. Uh, my feelings about myself and life drive me crazy. In what manner right now? And it's not right now. It's on the left side of the cross. It's all in the past. <clears throat> to play with justice, if we had a reasonably fictitious and sane psychiatrist, <laughs> <laughs> and I was really playing with justice, and we had reasonably fictitious and sane patients, then the psychiatrist could grab these people and say, listen, I understand emotional problems from A to Z, from neurosis to psychosis, I understand it fully, and let me tell you what, I can cure you right now, once and for all, I want to tell you, you can be as crazy as you want to right now in the present, but that's all. Limited to that, and you'll be all right. And my fictitious, reasonable, insane patients would go, now do it. <laughs> that you can be as crazy as you want to as long as you'll be crazy having to do with the contemporaneous environment and your relationship to it, to use high-class words. But you've got to cut out being crazy in the past. Next. That'd be it. <laughs> Rather than just talk about crazy people, since so many of you are interested in whatever blue circuit people would be, since so many of you feel as though that was your basis when you got here and you heard about it and you felt as though it's your center of gravity, you feel as though even though I make jokes apparently at uh, emotional and intellectual disturbance, while simultaneously or periodically pointing out that it's true that many of you will feel like you're going crazy and you have to fit that together best you can. But everyone would seem to have 
to varying degrees, and some of you to very strong degrees, an interest in what, what's going on with emotional people like me, or to use your old term, blue circuit-centered people. Let me point out something. To use the three types arbitrarily and artificially, are there being yellow circuit and blue circuit and red circuit based types of those who are being, whose voices are being driven primarily from the older, lower circuits and those who are being driven by the younger, higher circuits, and then those that seem to be stuck somewhere in a vice sandwich. <laughs> All these old poor blue circuit people. Let me point out something about blue circuit people, since I hardly ever talk about them, and now is a prime time. Here is the normal position of blue circuit people, or those who would qualify, even if you feel as though you're only blue circuitry, you know, every full moon, or every time a new model of a Pontiac comes out, or <laughs> every time you see Playboy centerfold for the month, whatever it is. I'm sure this won't be my final definition by any degree, but maybe the time's right to say a little bit more. Blue circuit people could normally be described as being those who cannot act to satisfy themselves and yet whose thinking of action is likewise incommodious, <laughs> unsatisfying. Blue circuit people could normally be described as being those who cannot act to satisfy themselves and yet whose thinking of action is likewise incommodious, <laughs> unsatisfying. Those of you who have such a proclivity, weasel your way out of that. <laughs> That is not an unfair description, as some of you felt. Just right quick, run it to the other extremes, you know, in which I have drawn the circuitry, you know, the red coming from the bottom up, the red and then the blue in the middle touching them both, and the yellow. If we talk about those who would apparently be driven by the lower, older circuits, we're talking about the men of action, the bricklayers, those that I should have maybe thought more before I acted, before I spoke. Then those at the other extreme, being driven by the higher, younger circuits, who would seem to be more involved and more driven, their primary responses be thinking about action in response to what they hear, what they see, what happens to them. But through varying degrees to the blue circuit people, can you see that they would look upon those other two, whether they look upon them physically or hear them described, as being in a superior position that sometimes I wish, I wish I hadn't even gone to school, I wish I had never, especially gone to college and started reading psychology and philosophy. I got a cousin. As a matter of fact, fortuitous as it may be, he lives in Alabama and the son of a bitch is a carpenter. And I, have, I don't ever see him worry. He gets arrested three or four times a year for drunk and disorderly. Two wives have left him. Every time they leave, they clean him out, what little he's got, and he just laughs about it. He says, what the hell, you know, a house trailer, I can get him for, you know, 2,000 bucks, easy come, easy go. <laughs> Once a month, I hear he gets his ass beat in a bar, and he laughs about it, he'll wake up in jail and laugh because he's got another tooth knocked out. <laughs> he'll get somebody to bail him out Monday morning, he'll have a quick beer and run out and go to work. God, wouldn't that be nice? He just seems like whatever, just, he just reacts to life and just moves along and he laughs and whistles. You know, through holes in his teeth. <laughs> With all, blue circuit people could say, all right, I also have a, uh, a brother-in-law teaches school up at MIT. And he and my sister come down several times a year. I never see that man rattled. Uh, in fact, my cousin, the old drunk carpenter, one time they got together and something came on TV and uh, some politician was making some speech about the Civil Rights Act or talking about the trouble in the Middle East. And I just knew there was going to be trouble. And my cousin, the, brick, the carpenter, he started all kinds of crap, prejudicial, offensive statements. 
and I got mad. I got confused. I got embarrassed. And my brother-in-law, he sat there and listened, and I know he comes from a quite liberal background. I mean, his parents were Unitarian ministers. <laughs> and he sat there and he listened to this shit. And he listened to it like he was going to analyze it, and he started asking my cousin questions. I mean, serious questions. At first I thought, well, he's, just, he's being smart aleck. And he wasn't. He didn't even seem to care. He took the whole thing like, well, I'll go away and think about it. If I couldn't be like my cousin, I'd like to be like him. He doesn't seem to get that involved with what's going on. It's like he just files it all away, and someday if I don't have anything better to do, and I've done the crosswords and puzzle in the New York Times, maybe I'll go think about this. <laughs> Either way, in a sense, apparently it rains. And these two people at the other end of a spectrum, they're different from me, one of them apparently runs out in the rain and he doesn't give a damn whether he gets wet and his clothes shrink up and fade. He doesn't care. He just laughs and goes on. He plops through the mud, falls down in the mud drunk and get up and laugh about it. And the other one looks out and it rains and he thinks, dear, where is my new umbrella? And he puts on his galoshers and puts on a coat. And it's like, well, all you got to do is prepare yourself. And he holds his umbrella and he walks <laughs> off to work. But me, it rains and I get pissed. I get mad. I refer you back to what I first described. And you could take this and expand it into the wonderful world of psychiatry if we were dealing with a fictitious, reasonably insane treaters and those to be treated. You could see the same thing. You can't find any way out. By their definition, by your feeling of it, by your feeling of your own problems, that what seems to be emotional disturbance, which is blue circuit activity. The normal position is that the person, the activity going on in the person, does not lead to satisfactory action. They can't act in a way to satisfy themselves. But also, their thinking about action is equally unsatisfying. That is a workable, take it to the bank, definition of an emotional person. Can't act, but my thinking about acting, one alternative. I can't do either one in a way I can find satisfactory, satisfying. It serves a purpose. It has served a purpose in the development of humanity. It is still serving a purpose. Those people serve a purpose. But there it is and there it is. What else can you call emotion? Yeah. Don't give me a definition out of a book. Don't read me something from Elizabeth Barrett Browning. When you're feeling emotional, of course, without you know by now, I'm speaking about ordinary emotions, which are always bad news. People don't question feeling good, other than the fact that I better watch it. I'm about to pay this back. But the emotional life is the soap opera. That's when people feel as though I'm being emotional, as I just simply don't feel good for an apparent specific reason, a fear I have, a lingering fear, a fear something's going to happen. And how can you weasel your way out? that you cannot act in a satisfactory manner. You've got one of two possible responses to whatever's going on, internally and externally. I'll be at the same thing. It's either act or thinking about acting. And blue circuit activity, ordinarily, does not provide acting that is satisfactory but the alternative, which works at every other end of the spectrum, thinking about acting is equally as incommodious. What are you left with? You, all you can do is get a guitar and hope you can go to Nashville or <laughs> write a soap opera, live a soap opera. 
And several weeks ago I asked, and there was not a great deal of immediate biochemical response I got from you as a whole, but when I ask, had any of you tried to take it any further? All of you should know. All of you should have done it. But all of you should have felt the validity of it, of me saying that the blues can be cured by sufficient running. Volumes may be, uh, I guess they have a shelf life. If they're old enough, you might take volumes and they didn't work. Uh, Obviously, prayer doesn't always work. Meditation, maybe you couldn't call your mother. But I've always given my money back guarantee that the blues can be cured. All you got to do is put on your Snickers, hit the street, and run long enough, and when you come back, you will no longer be in an emotionally distraught state. It is simply magic. <laughs> but it is not a psychological trick of some kind. And I asked some of you, had you tried to pursue it any further on your own, that something is actually taking place? If I get out and run, and it doesn't matter how bad you feel, I mean, it can be some terrible, something quite real in the physical sense of a death, a tragedy that affects you, but the kind of state that ordinarily comes about, the kind of blue circuit hole that takes over, Something magical will happen if you put on your little socks and you bounce out the door and you run long enough. You will come back and that state is gone. And it is a biochemical reaction that has taken place. It is not some magic trick. It is not some kind of spiritual illusion. People are inclined, including you people, mostly, most of the time, to feel as though you're more directly touched by lower circuit activity because it's dealing with this great huge organ. You know, all of you. And apparently you can put your hands on it or put your feet in it or put it in your feet or put it on your feet. But the other end of that spectrum is the kinds of little tricks that I gave out originally as task, but of forcing the circuits to talk about what's going on. Of staying in front of the mirror you know, every morning and saying, hello there, big boy, or hello there, old sweetie. Now, what is the problem for the day? <laughs> Or to put marbles in your mouth and to turn on the faucet <laughs> and to declaim to the world, or at least your own kitchen, the horribleness of your condition. <laughs> of everything that's wrong is don't hold back. Turn both voices loose. Give the silent voices, give them their own voice. Turn them up. Do not hesitate. They speak out. Sing out, act out, even unto yourself into a mirror. You poor, poor darling. <laughs> when you feel this bad, I know how you feel because, you know, look who you're talking to. <laughs> Nobody understands. You used to tell your mother she didn't understand. You tried drugs, you tried analysis, and right now you could kill yourself. And nobody understands. If it were not so terrible, it would be funny, wouldn't it? <laughs> it will. And so far as I care to describe it verbally, do that long enough, and it will, in essence, have the same effect as running long enough that the state you were seen to be in, the blue circuit activity, is just crushed. <laughs> now, ordinary voices could try to make some kind of psychological trick out of that, some kind of cheap shot or 
I guess one obvious thing to be would say, well, you know, you make fun of somebody's problems and maybe get a cheap laugh, but that doesn't make the problem go away. Hmm? So what do you want? This ain't Sears and Roebuck. Well, I guess if I was going to speak for humanity and give a more literate, urbane description would be back to the good old one. Well, wait a minute, those little tricks, running, you know, I tried it, you're correct, this talking, I don't even have to do that, I can hear what you're saying if I did that, or let's say I did try it, you're right. It's still cheap tricks, because all you're doing with these tricks is you're attacking, you're dealing with the symptoms, not the problem. But see, those of you who've forgotten, I already pointed out to you within the last six weeks that everything is a symptom. That's why you have 6,000 years of recorded history of them pointing out economically, religiously, politically, psychologically, that wait a minute, what we're trying to do here, I mean, sure it seems to be a problem, but this is not the problem, this is a symptom. We still have yet to get to the root of the problem. We're just dealing with a symptom. That's all there is. The symptom is the problem. No, no, I might go out and run right now and feel better, but what's going to happen? I bet you, are you going to tell me that two months later I won't feel like this again? <laughs> Next. <laughs> no, we're just dealing with symptoms. I want the problem alleviated. Of course, there is an alleviation for the problem. <laughs> it comes in several different sizes, 38s, 45s, 457s. <laughs> I'm going to do a quick drawing on you, having to do with things that I have talked about on several occasions, and to see if any of you can get it even more than I'm fixing to draw right quick. Of what seems to be change, and why I keep insisting that ordinary change is no change, and why I shouldn't even have to insist, that all of you should smell at the very least, something about it. But on a more physical basis, as back to, let's call that the great old brain. And my description to you that is fair and accurate, although it does not exist in exactly this manner, of there being what amounts to an area of antimatter, the unactivated mirrored reflection of the ignited side of your brain, that over here is what seems to be all the activities that is you. Thoughts, feelings, all possible. Sources of response, all forms of action, all possibilities of thinking about action and then what seems to be your feelings about thinking about actions. That if we drew, let's take one circuit, if I could draw out what amounted to the pattern. Let's say that that was the circuit that made that person drink alcohol and then something seems to have happened my great car wreck and the death of his child, the permanent maiming of his mate. Over here, in an area that was not previously ignited, there becomes a mechanical activation of a mirror circuit. But it is absolutely a mirrored reflection and the person who is now a passionate teetotaler. It is the same circuit on the other side of the brain that has been mechanically activated. It has been mechanically activated in an area that was previously inactive. But they both can't go on simultaneously in an ordinary person. 
and it is if it could be drawn, which it could be drawn, except I can't do it in 3D, much less 2D, that what has happened from going to being somebody describing himself, and of course I just keep using alcohol as an obvious example, but can get down to <coughs> apparent feelings about another person, apparent feelings about yourself. That at one time I was very shy around women that I had met for the first time. And then apparently something's happened. If it happens enough that another observer or the person would say, I am almost the opposite from what I used to be. The, yeah, I used to be like this, but now I am almost the opposite. It is not change. There is an absolute mirrored reflection in ordinary consciousness of everything that seems to be activated an ordinary consciousness of every opinion that one person says, I, I have an intense hatred for red-headed Unitarian women. There is an unactivated, absolute mirrored reflection of what would seem to be that same small burst of patterned energy that is absolutely, as far as words go, the opposite. And to be able to switch it from one into its mirrored reflection is absolutely nothing. But, as several people were hinting, I know I didn't make it very clear, about one of Heisenberg's corollaries of being able to, perchance, at a very high frequency, fast living, forget the ordinary songs about the fast lane when you get at that level, that you can take an equation and you can move observable time and observable energy that is, the time that it took for this energy to do its observable act, and you can steal from one and give it to the other. I suggest to you that there is a connection between that. I suggest to you further there is a connection between all of that in a quite real sense and what I call neuralizing, which sounds like you know, something I psychologically maybe stumbled upon, something I fooled around and observed about the workings of the mind and I came up with a term for it and it's just vague enough that you might fit in some unusual attempt. But what if? Ah, fuck what if. <laughs> Since most of you don't believe that anymore. What if? <laughs> what if there is an absolute quiet real in the physical sense, biochemical basis that would only be, right now, even talked about, only being found even in mathematical theory at an area so far removed from the beginning of this loop of articulation, that is, into the world of subatomic physics right now, wherein at one end of the loop, the macro world almost is in direct conflict with that which seems to be the observable macro world. They can't fit. Yeah. <laughs> that fits. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the longer you stay in one place, the less energy you have to get out. <laughs> but nobody remembers my older descriptions of like the searchlight like omnidirectional consciousness, not thinking about anything, never staring, or me saying that you could affect time, that time and what seemed to be ordinary consciousness were absolutely synonymous. I don't know, I'll have to think about that. I, in fact, I've been thinking about that, and I'll think about it some more. Go forth, you old sinner. Go forth and think about it some more. And perhaps we'll even discuss it again at some later date. Or perhaps we won't. One other thing to you people here and to you people out in the wonderful world of TV land. Let me tell you again, I'm aware Things come upon you people. 
some of you people who have not even been here this long have begun to have times that you begin to get glimpses of a paratopical universe. You've had times you thought you were going crazy. You've had times that you wanted to get hold of me or somebody and you've, it always works out miraculously that you're able to find a few of the people here in the group that know exactly what to do without me telling them and you find out that you're not nuts and you're not going to explode. All of that being a given, all that being unavoidable little waste stations. Also, there is a continuing quite real danger of any of you getting caught up into grand and glorious states wherein I'm not just simply about to explode in a way that frightens me. I can just taste. I can taste absolute oneness right around the corner. I can taste me getting somewhere close to being able to see all these weird things you're talking about. And my heart pounds. And the blood vessels down my head, and I look in the mirror, and I almost frighten me. I know, I know, I know. But I'm going to tell you one more time, and it doesn't matter who you are. Do not let yourself become entangled at any given time in that which becomes frightening enough, and that over which you obviously cannot produce at will, and you cannot control it at will. And if it ever becomes frightening, go out and run. Go out and take a cold shower if it's 25 degrees outside. Turn the holes on yourself nude. <laughs> the, the glorious pictures of going into some state of frightening ecstasy and passing out and laying there for days. <laughs> Or having people want to, your friends or family come around and want to put you away, leave that for the occult book writers. It happens enough to fairly ordinary people. They do not need any additional members in such organizations. And when it reaches the point that you're actually frightened, if you can't get hold of anybody here, if it just seems frightening, I'm telling you, go run yourself out of it. You're not going to lose it. But any form of, from a horizontal viewpoint, from everyday viewpoint, any form of instability, any form of any of you people losing control of some kind and feeling as though, well, this is the way things have to go, this is the way it should go, this is the way I always dream they're going, thank God I'm almost becoming a little flaky myself. No. No, you came to the wrong place. You can complete a certain loop, and then perhaps you might be, I hate to, of course, hold out false promise, but, you know, you might get as crazy as I am. But notice, you got to have some control over it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> i got a few I'm just going to read some of. People speak of taking a risk or a risky business. Aside from these, those situations in which physical harm is possible, could it be that what is behind the accepted meaning is this? A chance that the organism may be called upon to transfer or process energy it is not accustomed to, or that it may have to process energy in a way that is not its usual method. That sounds risky enough. <laughs> Would you say something else about why the idea of usual comfort sounds not as exciting as the creating of a certain kind of heat, of controversy. Uh, to use these terms, which are all right for the question, you got to try and remember through ordinary articulation until you see it without maps. It's what would seem to be comfort. 
is by the full definition an aspect of non-growth. Now, this does not belie the fact that one quite possibly, or let's say most assuredly, that everyone needs to take a coffee break now and then. Maybe everyone needs a vacation, and I don't mean two weeks in Florida. But if you're comfortable, something's wrong. And to say that the idea of that which might produce comfort does not sound exciting is a gross, I say gross, understatement. If you are comfortable, then nothing's going on other than taking a break. It's either that, taking a break from this viewpoint, or else you're back fulfilling your old position. I feel much better since he threw me out. It bothered me at first, but I must say I'm a better person for it. I just stayed continually upset. I kind of miss seeing the people, but I'm glad he did it. I feel much better now. Regarding fears, somebody writes this, it seems that fears are what are normally called fears. Well, they get down to pointing this out from one observation. It would seem to be the basic one is fear of rejection, of having another person say no to you. And why does having someone say no seem so incredibly strong? See, now I asked somebody that, that is all of you, a long time ago. Why is it that no seems to be such a response to be avoided? And it's not simply a verbal game, and it's not some psychological game. But why is it, this is back to this should be your continuing construction of a nonverbal encyclopedia, not just a dictionary. Why is it that everything seems to be arranged to where one organism presents possibilities or requests or presents ideas to another organism on the basis that what is expected, what seems to be the desired response is a yes of some kind. Because you could just as easily, let's, let's take this as a given, that all ordinary people do not want to be told no. All right? Then you could rephrase all questions, all ideas you present, all possibilities in such a way as to where a no response would be agreement with what you're saying. Like you present some idea and you say, is there any possibility I could no would always be a positive answer. Is there any possibility that what I've just said is totally, completely without merit? That it just, it didn't have any possibility of having any validity. Is that possible? No? Well, thank you. And it would not take that much additional time. But that is not the way things are arranged. And there does seem to be, built into everyone's circuitry, a great abhorrence. I mean, it just doesn't sound right. Nine. No. It's not... Of course you could say, if you're ordinary, well, it's not just the word. I mean, it's the tone of voice and everything behind it. Are you sure? People can say no and smile. No. And it still seems to strike people. So remember, I asked you first a long time ago. <laughs> There was a couple of more questions whether I brought them out or not concerning last week I read a piece of one if you recall asking about how one might attempt to deal with the two voices or is there some what specifically be done and I pointed out to you several possibilities you know things that you could attempt to do to take that which seems to be the quieter of the two in any given situation and it's to increase its volume but based upon one or two people asked me something, 
Let me stress this one part again right quick. There is a real valid attempt to be made once you can see, once you can feel, once you can hear that there are two voices going on. And that one always seems to have some kind of predominance, whether it be in volume, intensity, velocity. It's to try and hear them both equally simultaneously to where you have no preference. You don't let them seem to express a preference. You don't let one outweigh the other. It's simply an attempt to hear them both equally and simultaneously, constantly. Now that is a trick. Someone else, I won't read everything they wrote, but the gist of it was, the question is, is there a difference as they seem to take from some of the things they'd heard on some of the tapes before they got here, is there some kind of real difference between whatever I mean by pain and whatever I mean by suffering? And the person was correct that I did intend a difference at the time. Of course, the words are synonymous probably in the dictionary. But the way in which I was using it was quite specifically at the time. That pain, to divide them into two separate entities, right quick before I take it any further. The pain would be red circuit based. Whereas what I refer to as suffering would come from higher regions that would be of mixed lineage. It would be from mixed parentage. And there is another time-honored trick. I like saying that since I just made these things up in the last 10 years to say time-honored <laughs> historically validated. If you have any doubt as to the difference between pain and suffering, then stop in the midst of your melodrama and discover this. It's quite easy. You think, well, I am suffering discomfort. Am I involved with pain or suffering? All right. Can the discomfort continue without words? If it does, you can count on being a victim of pain. If this discomfort, while not having to run, while not necessarily having to go and talk to yourself in the mirror, if you can withdraw, all you got to do, of course, is look at it as your own individual particle physicist, is to look at the suffering or the discomfort, you don't know which it is yet. And you look at it and you can stop the words that are supporting it, the voices that are talking about it. If you stop it and suddenly the discomfort stops, <coughs> then you stop the examination and you look away and you're back being discomforted and the words are back, then believe me, you have another animal. You have another demon. If you can withdraw the verbal support and the discomfort stops, a frim, a fictitious, reasonably insane man, or a, a frip, a fictitious, reasonably insane person, would have cause to go, hmm, that I was suffering just as well as I had ever done. I believed I could suffer along with the best of them. And all I did would stop the words that were going on right then, and the whole thing fell apart. Well, it came back soon enough, but all I gotta do is stop and look at the words and try to find either their position or what their velocity is, and they stop, and the discomfort stops. That is not pain. And of course that, after a certain length of time, is that is that over which I have absolutely no, as, as the world calls it, sympathy or interest in any of you suffering or undergoing because that can be stopped. I've just told you how. 
Pain's another matter. But suffering, once you see it, once you even have a continuing vague knowledge that what I'm describing I am completely, totally aware of, then for you to expect any kind of sympathy for your problems from me, and I can't understand how you survived here this long. Well, you just don't know. Well, all right, take away the verbal support. If we got down to pain, I am con as concerned as you are. Pain even concerns me if it was me. <laughs> but once you know how to stop it, and then you expect, well, I've got a long way to go. I have terrible things plaguing me, and you just don't know. Oh, yes, I do. And in a good lucid moment, a good hot moment, yes, you do too for a split second. Because just do the grand experiment. Can you separate the verbal support or the verbal activity from the discomfort? Does the discomfort continue? If so, next. I had several questions, which apparently I didn't bring out the specific one, but they amounted to new inquiries and observations having to do with love. Of me last week pointing out a certain part of passion, if that was at the red circuit basis of the original attraction. But someone asked in the midst of some observations, made the comment of, they felt as though they really needed to learn how to love. That was the, trust me, that's a fair retelling of at least one or part of one sentence, of I want to or I need to learn how to love. And I'd like to give everyone several seconds to ponder that. I cannot quote you any poetry, but I feel safe in stating that that has been said for thousands of years in some text. So if I could learn to love, and I don't mean just religiously, somebody believing that love is the zenith of their religion or their religious pursuit, but that I need to learn how to love my relationships with the opposite sex, my fellow man. But let's put it on a sexual basis. It seems as though I can't really get deeply involved with somebody. It seems as though my relationships are ephemeral to say the least. It seems as though when I feel a great deal of passion for a particular man or woman, wouldn't you know it? It's always the kind of person that seems to have no interest in me. In other words, suffering. And so it would seem not to be inappropriate to verbally put it as though I would like to learn how to love, that there is this thing to love, and it's something in which I was not fitted genetically, or it was something that uh, was not brought out in me by my early environment. It is something lacking in my total educational experience to learn how to love. I would like everyone to take several additional seconds. And I'm not being funny. And it sounds right that there's obviously something lacking in me, in my experience, and my knowledge, and my outlook, and I need to learn how to love. I am going to come back at some future date, because I think I'll give you more than a few seconds, that it sounds right to everybody, that I could at least learn to love better. Maybe I don't have a great deal of problems, but obviously everyone could learn to love better, to learn to love better. Even though I said I'd give you additional time to ponder it, I still cannot resist asking you more or less what I've asked you before. What is it you think love is? or your own experience, or your own definition. 
if you could free yourself, or if you even struggled to free yourself from the barbed wire fence limits of the mind, if you could come up with some kind of new approach, if you could stick your finger in a verbal crack at least to start somewhere else, what is it that humanity means by it? What is actually going on that it comes out and love is called everything from a grand cardinal inquisitor torturing somebody in the name of love to somebody committing suicide in the name of love to somebody drinking themselves into an early grave if not an extended liver under the name of love if all of that can take place, it all seems to be contradictory, it seems to be ill-defined, it seems to be in conflict with itself at times, then this is a reflection of something, but what is the something? What is actually going on here? And how is it that sounds right to say, I need to learn to love better? I believe, sure, I had one good funny one I was going to. I do. There must be a mathematical law of exact proportions which states, colon, for each and everything that you fix on your car, <laughs> there is an equally unconnected something else on your car that will break simultaneously at the same instant that the first thing is fixed. <laughs> now, I had never actually gone that far, but it is a small step, would you not agree, that I could point out that which I'd started of instantaneous communication, but now yeah. amongst inorganic systems. Why not? We're still talking about molecular activity. I've got a, I've got a task that I want everyone to do. And I, of course, expect everyone to faithfully attempt to do this, and I want you to write it down and hand it in. There is always the quite real possibility that if you absolutely attempt to neuralize this and come up with nothing, don't sit down just to apparently please me and write down something because I can always tell that and it does anything but please me. That's not the point. But what I was describing as being a kind of chord progression of what would apparently be good or that which might apparently be a constructive something and how it can go into and always will that love ain't nothing but the first stage of the blues or that that which appears to be evil is nothing but either the second or third chord progression or second or third stage from that which was originally from that same viewpoint. Good. I want you to just on your own, you don't have to go read history books, all of you are sophisticated enough. See what strikes you historically. I used the church already, the Catholic church, Christian church, that from one viewpoint was apparently there it was, the religion, the force of good and love. And sometime later, it is literally, physically torturing and killing people. What are the historical examples? Just let it float around and neuralize it. See if you can come up with stratigraphs. Without hurting yourself, of course, as always. And you children, don't try this at home, of course. <laughs> Not, not unless you're with an adult. And I don't know any of you people who know any adults. <laughs> and see if you can find any that come up in your own personal life. I've already given you a hint. Just look at every love affair you ever had. 
So let's get that out of the way so that all of you won't fill up a page with that. <laughs> Everybody who's ever been in love, no matter what you called it, I never called it that until I met you people. But everybody who's ever been in love, you know, you've already relived the Christian church. You've already gone through the chord progression. Well, I love her. I can't do without her. See, this is a passage of time. <laughs> if I ever see that bitch again, I'll kick her ass. So don't. Unless you got an astounding one, don't bother with that. That's a love affair. That is contempt, ill feelings. It's just the second and third stage, or the third stage, of real love. Bloody nose is the second or third stage of a passionate kiss. A split, a split lip is the second or third stage of a good fuck. That's it. So what else is new? So see if you can locate something a little more subtle, a little more surprising. Someone did ask again, we still got some tape, brought up again what little I mentioned last night about this thin veneer. I don't want, I don't intend to wrap up the tape on a questionable note, but all of you should have a continual awareness that every, from the part of a spectrum in the ordinary world that looks at the world of stable personalities and in the world of those who are mentally or emotionally unstable. There is a very thin veneer. I mean, it's so thin that it's almost silly to talk about holding up a piece of paper like that. A veneer between what seems to be a quite stable, civilized, predictable person and that which would appear to be, by horizontal accounts, a maniac. But all the way from what might appear to be that kind of observable extreme is into that which you feel is, well, this is my, now my own understanding. I am more stable. I am now more of a real person than I ever was before I got involved with this. I feel now, even though I may not could answer him exactly, I feel that there is some predictability. There is some stability in me that I could trust myself within reason. I'm not trying to give you the blues, but there remains at varying levels, and it has to do with the circuits themselves. There remains a continuing thin veneer if you have any doubt about it, of what I'm saying, look down to the older, lower circuits. And just think, my dears, the thin veneer between you being alive and you being dead, that you could drop by the time a second hand on an analog watch moves from point here to point there, you can drop, and it's all over with the shouting. You are yesterday's news. How is that for a thin veneer? Or you're always just a heartbeat away from no heartbeat. <laughs> the kind of stability that ordinary people think about and dream about comes about in one's own lifetime, but it comes about in the upper circuits. Because everyone sitting here and listening out there to varying degrees within a kind of reason that I have in mind should have a kind of lower circuit stability already. As I've told you, you've got to be kind of red circuit sane and partially blue circuit, curable at least, <laughs> to ever properly get here. That is, you should understand the need to exercise. You should understand the need not to get involved, once I point out to you, with letting health be a hobby. You should understand that the byword in our hospital here is fuck health. You know, just be healthy and that's the end of it. If you're not healthy, that is, you're suffering from pain, you know, you're not healthy. It's not a hobby, but there's got to be that kind of stability. <coughs> the rest of it you have to build. And the thin veneer uh, should not frighten one. What should be frightening in the sense of being encouraging is to really begin to see for yourself how thin it has been and how cocksure most of humanity appears to be. 
that the Pope, you know, makes his magical signs and hundreds of thousands of people applaud and, you know, he doesn't know any more than you do or a man comes out and he says, I am now president of your country and all will be well. And he ain't got the least idea what he's going to do tomorrow. You know, hell, I'm elected, I'm going to wallow in it. Yes, have no fear. <laughs> or you, you know, you're all dressed up and boy, ain't I sharp. And the first bar you walk in, you walk over this girl and you say, hey, what's happening? And she throws up on you just looking at you. <laughs> Just a heartbeat away. The kind of stability, though, comes from another level. And we're running out of tape, and I will bid adieu and ciao to all of you people in TV land.